and uh, she has stirred up the pot and, and uh, you know, and, and really caused a lot of uh, dialogue around what it takes to uh, provide great education for every kid. And uh, so we wanted to start our, our discussion today uh, with uh, that uh, video clip. Now this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, two individuals come up uh, that are going to help us look at, uh, one, the big picture of uh, educational excellence for our kids, for the young people in our community. What does it take for, uh, for the educational system to work for everybody? And then more specifically, what should the faith community do? What can we do? And um, later in the week, we're going to have a panel with all kinds of varieties of approaches so we're going to keep working on this, but um, Nicole Baker Fulgram is going to help us to frame that. And uh, Nicole is uh, the vice president for Teach for America, one of the most influential uh, education organizations in the country. And uh, her job is to help to mobilize the faith community uh, within Teach for America, because many Christians are uh, Teach for America students. Anybody here Teach for America teacher? Is there anybody? All right, couple over here. All right, good, good. We're glad you're here. They work so hard, they don't have time to go to a conference, okay? But uh, the, the, the other thing that's important for you to know about Nicole is that she is going to... Uh, uh, she's about ready to launch a new uh, organization that is focused on faith-based groups, and she's going to tell you about that. Wonderful person. I, I know you're going to be really inspired by her. Uh, and then um, Lisa Ramirez will come up next. Lisa is with the Department of Education, and she runs all the migrant pro uh, 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 programs for uh, the U.S. Department of uh, Ed. Now, I want you to know that she is not coming here in an official capacity with the Department of Ed, all right? She's coming here to talk to you about her story. When I met Lisa, I was so moved by her kind of uh, commitment to education, how she worked through the struggles to get to where she is today, that uh, I thought it would be really good for us to hear from her. And then thirdly, we're going to have a special surprise. I'm not going to tell you about her until later, okay? So, Nicole, why don't you help me... Uh, Welcome, Nicole. All right. Great. Now, last night I had to hug Richard like this, and now I have to hug Nicole. I mean, everyone's taller than me, you know. So that's all right. I'm not going to feel mad about I'll that. feel intimidated. That's okay. right. <laughs> so, Nicole, uh, one thing that, that uh, I wanted to start with is you were instrumental in helping the Willow uh, Summit get Michelle there, right? You were yeah. working behind the scenes with Jim Mayato mm -hmm. and all those folks. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Well, Wendy Kopp, who is the CEO and founder of Teach for America, spoke at Willow, I guess now, two or three years ago. And so it was great to be able to have her there and talk about Teach for America's approach to, to education and closing the achievement gap. And we're just really grateful that the folks in the Willow Creek Association and Pastor Bill Hybels have continued to stay very interested and committed to really trying to figure out how faith communities can get involved and help close the achievement gap. And when they were asking for um, additional people to speak, she obviously was one of the people that we thought would be would be great and at the time she was still the chancellor of DC public schools at the time when she spoke she she wasn't anymore but it worked out well okay well uh, when you were backstage again watching that clip mm -hmm. what really struck you again as you think about Michelle's approach and what she has contributed to this whole issue you know I think Michelle you know despite I think you know folks' opinions about sort of the way she approached the work, I think her overall goal of just such a sense of fierce focus on our kids learning, are we doing the right things for kids in the system, and the urgency that she had to move, I think, very, very quickly, whereas I think a lot of times there's so many, you know, people and players to consider in moving an entire system to bring it to change and that we can often sort of feel intimidated or think, as she said in the clip, we need to go slowly. But I think the example she gave of, you know, putting your own kids in that situation, would you want your child to have to wait, you know, two or three years, you know, 
for a teacher who's really, really struggling, we have to find a way to, you know, be sensitive, of course, because everyone's growing. Teaching is the hardest job. I've been a teacher and it's the hardest job. But at the same time, how do we move forward with a sense of urgency that can really get our kids where they need to go because we just can't keep losing generation after generation of kids who are not achieving at the levels that we know they can. So the idea that is being uh, popularized the day of, uh, you know, waiting for Superman or, you know, how, you know, do we just wait and wait and wait until we find the right solution. Now, it seems like Michelle did the complete opposite. She jumped in and she radically brought about change. Now, is that the right approach, do you think? Uh, obviously, the, the yeah. results there were not necessarily long term. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that approach? I think it's an interesting way to approach change, right? I mean, I think any leader who wants to do something radically different and really bring significant change to a system that, for in a lot of respects, has been broken for decades, they have to do something radically different. Um, I think the, the, so the short-term goal was, yes, Michelle was able to be um, effective in terms of raising student achievement, you know, test scores did go up, and the metrics that we look for to determine whether or not a system is effective were improving. I think the downside of that is what happened in the long term is that Michelle wasn't able to stay and continue the work that she started. Um, I would say in part because of um, the process and the approach and just a lot of other political factors that I think were, were impacting her. Um, she has a great person uh, who's, who took her, her, uh, her successor, Kaya Henderson, who's the current chancellor, is phenomenal, and they have been really good friends and colleagues and coworkers for years, so I am confident that the approach and the, the reforms are going to continue under Kaya as well, but it was unfortunate to see that you know, Michelle um, wasn't able to find a way to really sustain her impact in the city. Now, I'm going to bring this up. It's, it's a little bit sensitive, but I, I do think within the context of CCDA and, and because of the work we do, uh, really being advocates for justice and, and working within cross-cultural settings, uh, many of us who are committed to going into, into neighborhoods where we're not of that community, but yet, you know, we really care. One of the things that I have heard as I have spoken, especially to African-American friends and, uh, that have reflected on the, the way Michelle went in, uh, the, the kind of the racial issue, okay? Uh, uh, how much of a factor was that? And, and I, I know that's, that's kind of a tough question, but I think many of us face that, okay? When we're trying to bring about change, uh, we, we have to deal with the, those kind of dynamics. You know, if you look at the sort of polling data, when Mayor Fenty um, lost his bid for re-election, it was split so radically across racial lines. The, the basic sort of takeaway is that overwhelmingly, um, white residents who tend to be the wealthier uh, folks in D.C. voted for Fenty largely because they supported Michelle Rhee, and the opposite was true, that the majority of African Americans in D.C. did not vote for Fenty, and Michelle was cited as, I think, probably one of the number one or number two reasons why. Um, I mean, I think my takeaway from that, a couple of things. I think the way the media has portrayed that, um, that divide has been unfortunate because I think the sort of narrative has been, oh, you know, see, you know, Michelle Ree was doing something great for the kids of DC, test scores were going up, but oh, you know, the, the poor, you know, low-income African-American and Latino parents didn't really know, like, how great she was, and it was a little weird, <laughs> in my opinion, because yeah. my, my takeaway as well is that I've never met a parent in any community of any race, economic background, who didn't want the very best for their kids. You're never going to meet a parent who's like, oh, I hope my child flunks out of high school and doesn't graduate. Show me that parent. I've never met them. Um, and so I think the unfortunate thing was that it was sort of portrayed this way, and, and I think I don't think Michelle thought that, but I think that's the, the story that was sort of told about this. But I think what the, the deeper issue is, is that when you're working with very different communities, right, in D.C., uh, you have a group of individuals who, in the African-American community, and I'll speak to that since I know it best, have been disenfranchised and have not been able to feel like their voice has been heard historically in D.C. And so for me, as an African-American woman, who um, is college educated, I feel a sense of privilege um, because of that, that it goes along with being college educated. I didn't necessarily need Michelle and Mayor Fenty to come and sort of hear my voice because I was looking at it from just a pure data perspective. I'm like, great, kids are learning, crime is down, it's all good. But if you're a different parent who's had a different experience, you actually do need someone to hear your perspective, to feel like you're being brought into the conversation and to sort of miss that or not value it in the way that the community needs to be 
you're just going to have a really hard time. And so I think it's, it's all of that historical context that just made it really hard um, for, with an approach that Michelle and Mayor Fenty took to be able to get people to buy into that. And I think it's unfortunate, honestly, on, on many sides, because I, I do think that the goals that Michelle had and sort of the, the intense focus on student achievement and the urgency were right. I mean, that's what we have to do to change systems that are massive and that need a lot of support. It's just we have to be able to find ways to genuinely include everyone in the conversation about education reform, because if we don't, we're just not going to get there. It's always, it will continue to feel like we're doing something to someone else as opposed to it being a, a community process that still needs to be urgent <laughs> and focused, but it needs to be, um, I think, genuinely inclusive. Yeah. Amen. Well, as uh, we've gathered this week, uh, we are trying to get a grasp of what are the factors, right? I, I think this week uh, we've had a lot of conversation on the board and with many people about are we going to come out with a declaration at the end of this time, right, that says this is what CCDA uh, believes is the answer to educational reform. And what we're really concluding is that this week is the beginning of a long-term conversation. And uh, we want to understand the factors. We want to know what, uh, we know some of the things that Michelle brought up. We, we, we hear the teacher impact uh, uh, factor. But uh, I know that you work for a very influential uh, organization, uh, Teach for America. Wendy has another book, A Chance to Make History, where she lays out kind of a broad uh, vision for what it would take to uh, bring about change in our school system. Uh, and one point she makes is that there's no silver bullet. There's yeah. no one thing that's going to do it all. You, you, can you talk about, or would you frame out for our uh, members, uh, what are the big factors, right? What are the big things that we need to look at th that you believe are really critical if we're going to make change? Sure. And, you know, there are definitely different perspectives on this, so I will share mine, and um, I will take off my Teach for America hat since I technically uh, don't work there as of a couple we'll of weeks ago. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Yeah, um, so. But I think in the context of, of what Wendy has in this book, I, I do think she's casting a fairly broad net. And I think that's the challenge with education reform, right? All of us are in this. We know things need to change for kids. And we're like, tell us the one thing. Or maybe there's even two or three things. Like, what do we absolutely have to do? And it's just, unfortunately, bigger than that. The good news is that there are some things that we do know that work, that we absolutely have seen over time can change things for kids. We have so many examples now of you know, entire schools. Um, the Urban Prep Academies is one great school in Chicago that um, you may have heard of it. They've been in the media a lot. But it's a 100% African-American male. Um, academies, high schools, and they are in some of the most challenging neighborhoods in Chicago where on the average, only one out of every 40, as in 4-0, African-American men will ever graduate from college. But in the first two graduating classes of Urban Prep, 100% of all those beautiful black boys are college bound. Four-year colleges. Wow. So you, we just have so many examples of this, and you know, particularly for us as people of faith, I just feel like we cannot sort of sit by and think, is it possible to change the system? I don't know, maybe. The evidence is in front of us. It's not just one school, it's dozens, it's hundreds, it's teachers, it's districts that are seeing dramatically different outcomes for kids. So then to your question, we look at what can we then isolate and learn from those examples. Like, that's why we have them. <laughs> Let's take and learn from them, and what can we apply? And one of the things that's consistent is similar to what Michelle said. The biggest determining factor of a child's success in terms of within school factors is the quality of the teacher in front of the classroom. That just is the biggest determining factor. There obviously are some home and, and other issues that um, in poverty and all of that comes into play, but things we can control within the school system, it's the quality of the teacher. So how do we develop policies and systems that help us recruit, select, train, support, long-term develop the most effective teachers? So that's one, one big factor. There's also the human capital issue that Michelle talked about with school leaders. It's a huge uh, differentiator as well, having an incredibly focused, driven, high-quality principal leading a school. The other things that we do look at, we, we have to have a way to really be able to get a sense of what kids can know and do. And I know there's, you know, sort of this general theme out there that we over-test kids and I think in many cases we do, but at the end of the day, we do have to have some assessment so we know whether or not kids are learning 
so we can reteach, so we can change the processes we're taking. But I think along with that, we have to be able to link all of that student achievement data to um, the schools, to the districts, to the institutions that train teachers. Are they producing teachers that are actually helping kids learn when they go out and leave their, their colleges and, and, and teacher training institutions. And the bottom line is we have to make sure that parents have all of that information because they're the stakeholders, right? It's the kids and the parents and the community members. They need to be able to know, you know, to what extent is my school actually delivering on the promises that they're supposed to? And then if they're not, how do we change this? And how do parents get a lot of that accountability and power resting in their hands to really help bring about significant change in the system? Well, uh, you're in Washington. Yeah. Uh, most of us are in our communities. Uh, what role does the church play, right? Can we have any role? Uh, how important is that? Now, this launches us into a little bit to your new venture. So why don't you talk about sure. that? Why do we, you know, why not stay with Teach for America? I know it's a great organization. I love you, Teach for America. I, I, I know that uh, <laughs> it's fantastic, but what, what's behind it? And, and, and maybe what's motivating you personally to do this? Sure. Um, so as Noel said, I've been leading this initiative at Teach for America for the last couple of years to engage faith communities, in part because we found out that about 50% of our teachers at Teach for America said that their faith of, of multiple faith backgrounds was an important and significant reason why they chose to join our mission. Not surprising for all of us here, we get the connection between our faith motivating us to work on justice and service. But what we found in this work with Teach for America is that we were really missing an opportunity to impact faith communities much far beyond encouraging people to apply to Teach for America or to support our mission. You know, we're getting a chance to talk to, you know, com uh, congregations of this size and just really being able to influence folks. And we just realized, wow, there's a lot more that churches and other people of faith and faith-based organizations can do to support education broader, you know, than Teach for America. So that's why this organization that I'm launching um, is called the Expectations Project. And I've been at it for um, 14 days now, so it's very new. Um, okay. But we do have a website, and I think they'll put that on the screen at some point if you're interested in learning more. But what the mission of this organization is going to, is going to be to mobilize Christians and faith-based communities to become true advocates and champions for education reform for kids in public schools. We are doing so much as, as the church and um, as people of faith, we're doing tutoring programs and you know, sponsoring you know, school events and things like that, which are all great. And those individual things need to continue by all means. We need as many people tutoring and effective tutoring programs and you know, giving kids resources to help get them through school. But then, to Michelle's point, there's this broader system, right? We have so many more things that we need to be able to impact. And as much as I love being able to be a tutor, as, which I do through my actual church um, back in the DC area, I love doing that, but I know I'm only reaching one child. And that child is valuable, of course. You know, we want to make sure that child gets what he or she needs, but I also believe God wants us to have a heart for the broader system. And so that's what the Expectations Project is going to do, is to equip and train and support Christians and other people of faith and faith-based organizations to really take an advocacy approach to education reform. What are the policies and the systems and structures that we can impact? We have a massive voice. I really believe God wants us to be the people that are speaking to the systems and structures and really seeing the kingdom of God on earth in every possible system and structure we can. And public education is a massive one that definitely needs our help, and I believe that we have the potential to really change the game um, in a really positive way for kids. So when we, uh, yeah. When we begin to lift our voice, where do we, what do we start saying? I mean, uh, si sí, se puede. Sí. I mean, that's, that works. that's a start. That's a start. But what do we, I mean, what, what's that collective voice begin? I, I know that's a, yeah. putting you on the spot here. That's but, okay. Uh, any thoughts? I mean, I think some of the, the things that I talked about a few moments ago, and, and I think some of the themes um, that Michelle Rian and other people that are talking about education reform are sort of the right things, right? Part, first of all, what we have to do, I think, is to build awareness in faith-based communities. I think all of us in this room are aware that there's an achievement gap, but I speak at lots of places around the country, and people 
are less aware in many congregations, yeah. uh, in many organizations, because if it's not in your own backyard, it's easy to forget that this is such a significant problem that you know, half of the kids in low-income communities never graduate from high school. Only one in 10 will ever graduate from college. I mean, those are dire statistics. So I think part of it is awareness building and really helping to shape the conversation, not only that there's a problem, but that, that example I gave of urban prep academies, that's the standard, and that's happening. We have to be able to encourage people, because who wants to work on a problem that can't be solved? If it just feels like it's massively overwhelming, no one wants to do that. So I think we can be the people who I like to call us vision casters, is the word I've been using, because that's really what it is. We're casting a new vision for what's possible for kids in low-income schools. And then I think we do go and talk about specific policies and specific systems and structures and practices. It looks different in every state. Um, and so the campaign we're building with the Expectations Project is going to be state specific because we know there are different needs in terms of what the possible changes are there. Um, but I think, again, focusing our efforts on what's going to work for kids. Um, one of the things I like to say a lot is that I know there are people that we have to care about in every single aspect of the educational system, from the kids to the parents to the teachers, they're all valuable. And as Christians and people of faith, that matters to us. But I also believe we're called to work on the behalf of the most disenfranchised. That's my reading and interpretation of the Bible. So when I look at the public school system, the most dis disenfranchised people in the system are the kids particularly the kids in low-income public schools. So I think about what policies are going to work for those most disenfranchised people and sort of go from there. All right. Amen. I, um, I do love the name Expectations Project because uh, I think we are the folks that really do believe uh, in our children. And we, we see the value in kids that a lot of times others don't. Uh, some of us saw the movie Stand and Deliver last night, okay, remember that? And that movie is that story of Jaime Escalante who mm -hmm. goes into that uh, East L.A. school and while nobody believed these kids could learn, he says, I'm going to teach them calculus mm -hmm. or calculas, right, as uh, <laughs> some of his kids like to call it. And, uh, but, uh, but here's, here's a, you know, so we know that that works, that, that was a great example. But one of the most, uh, I remember the first time I saw that movie, the most uh, heartfelt, disappointing uh, parts of that movie made me really angry was after these kids all passed the test, the, uh, uh, the AP exam, the, mm -hmm. yeah, AP exam uh, that would have given them college credit, by the way, uh, they were accused of cheating. Right. It's and like we can't I, believe that all these Latino kids yeah. from like, you know, East LA could have actually done that. Right, yeah. and, and then, uh, you know, uh, basically, Jaime says something like this. You know, if you, do, if you do this, accuse these kids without any basis, what you're saying is that the system that they're now prepared to excel in doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that, that some of those frustrations that many of us have, we're working, we're doing all we can, we're laboring, we're trying, we're trying to innovate, we're trying to do whatever, and, and yet we keep bumping into those uh, walls. Yeah, I mean, this is why this idea of being able to really lift up examples of success is crucial. Because we have, we like to call it the sort of prevailing ideology, basically the way we think about what's possible for kids in low-income communities. Now, no one, this is like the dirty little secret. Most people in polite conversation are never going to actually say like, you know what, I really don't think those kids in Compton, which is where I taught, or, you know, Detroit, which is where I'm from, can actually learn. But honestly, like, that's in the back of a lot of folks' minds in this country. And no one really says it, but I think our actions say it. So when I was teaching in fifth, I taught fifth grade in Compton, um, one of the things I was doing was trying to, you know, again, raise the expectations for my kids. But at one point, you know, I was a, a kid from Detroit. I went to the University of Michigan. My kids knew my whole life story. And at one point, one of them was like, well, Miss Baker, why are you here? Couldn't you get a job anywhere else? Didn't you go to a good college? Like, why are you working here in Compton? And I was like, oh, it's because, you know, I wanted to work where the geniuses are. Like, I'm trying to, you know, replicate my idea of 
my brilliant fifth graders, which I truly believed. And he just looked at me and started laughing. He was like, for real? Like, nobody thinks we're geniuses because we don't have toilet. I mean, he started to list all the things our school didn't have. No toilet paper, our books are old, you don't even have computers for us. I mean, he was like, no one thinks we're geniuses because they wouldn't have given us a school like this if they really thought we were geniuses. Mm. And I was like, wow. Um, Okay, um, I still get a little choked up when I think about that because it was just so profound to see this, at the time, a 10-year-old who had figured it out. And I think it's what you're talking about. How do we change the conversation and change what society expects from our kids? We, again, it's the church, people of faith, we have huge potential to say, this is what we believe. We have such a strong voice. We have the moral, you know, the moral stance that we can, we can take. And how do we change that conversation? So, you know, kids who get taught by amazing teachers like Jaime Escalante won't get that same thing pushed back in their face like, there's no way you all could actually do it. We have to be the ones doing that, full stop. Well, well um, as, uh, as we think about a gathering of, you know, almost 3,000 people here, and these are all folks with really deep passion for, for God, for Christ, um, what, what difference does this make? I mean, you're all over the country trying to make change. I mean, I, I think we need to hear, because maybe we don't understand the impact that we might be able to have. Tell us you know, how important these, you know, the fact that we're here talking about education in this way and trying to do something about it. Just what do you think about that? It's phenomenal. I am so excited to see this. Um, I, again, I, I speak at a lot of different places and have a lot of conversations with, with leaders like uh, Noel and really trying to encourage people of faith to take up this issue, to really make this a priority, and it's tough, right? Because there's a million other things that are coming, you know, vying for our attention. The world is full of need, the country is hurting, it's broken. And to see an organization like this with leaders and you all who are truly working in the community and have the deep relationships and understand your neighborhoods better than anyone, to focus on this is massive. And so I think, I hope that this, you know, whole experience at this conference encourages you that your work obviously matters, but even thinking about the impact that you can have as you kind of, I like to call it sort of step out from what you're doing in the community and kind of go up to, you know, 20,000 feet and look down at the whole system and think, okay, how can we really leverage our collective impact and resources and voice to be able to impact even many, many, many more kids? because the potential is there, and I just think, I just believe there's a movement. I mean, I'm just gonna say it. I really think that God is doing something in public schools because I'm just hearing more and more people saying, you know, we've gotta be able to do more. This determines kids' life's pro life prospects. This educational system has the potential to continue the cycle of poverty or break it. That's how vital it is. It's, I think, the most important work that can be done. I'm obviously a little Amen. biased, but. Amen, yeah. As, uh, you know, as we close this time, I, I want to just uh, go back and, and pick up on something that Thurman Williams shared when he uh, gave us uh, that opening night, great message. Uh, he talked about the school, right, that they have in the community. Uh, Alan Tibbles, who, who died recently, great catalyst of ministry, but he was really... Uh, you know, helped along and maybe led by his wife, Susan. And Susan was going to be here uh, uh, tomorrow to be a part of this panel. But uh, with all the changes, she, she really felt like she could not be here. But uh, the part of the story uh, that Thurman did not tell is after the new song leaders responded to start this school, Christian school, you know, from this... Uh, after school program to the school, that the Baltimore uh, School District saw that they were doing such a great job that they actually came to Susan and New Song uh, and said, would you run our public school that we want to build in this community? And they built a brand new school in that community. And Susan, you're the principal, do whatever it takes. Hire who you want to hire. And, you know, I may be getting a few facts wrong. You can correct me later. <laughs> but I was invited to go there to speak at chapel. Now, how do you have chapel at a public school? Well, it's voluntary. It, you know, you can come if you want right before uh, school starts. 
Well, everybody was there because of the love and relationships. Now, before you start thinking it was such a, oh man, wonderful, there was a fight that broke out in the middle of chapel, okay? And, uh, but boy, they broke it up really fast. And uh, so I was very impressed, you know. Nobody said this is gonna be easy, right, all right? right? But can you imagine that the church is doing something so well that government comes, hey, we need you to run this school for us. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Okay. So. I think it goes to exactly what you're saying. Okay. Now, uh, thank you for laying out some of these issues. There's much more to talk about, and we're going to continue. But I want to bring out another guest. Uh, uh, I want to bring out Lisa Ramirez right now. I already told you a little bit about her, but let's welcome Lisa as she comes up. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Good to have you here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, Whoa. Uh, there is, I, I'm, I don't want to be like uh, bragging like John says, okay? But uh, John writes books and he, you know, he gets all famous for that. Well, I, I have a different anointing on my life, okay? <laughs> what I do is I go to people, I say, wow, you ought to write a book. <laughs> and they go write a book. I don't write books, all right? <laughs> I just help people come up with the courage to go write their own. So uh, Lisa I, and I, I went to her office and talked to her in Washington. And when we were talking, she said, oh, man, you know, I've been thinking that she was going to speak at some big deal before this. I've been, uh, I, I told her, man, your story is so wonderful. You ought to write a book. And she said, uh, you know, she didn't take me too seriously, I didn't think. But she went out and wrote the book. And, and this was just, uh, I mean, this was not too long ago. How, how long ago was that that we yeah, were? Yeah, it was just, um, actually, um, you came to visit with me a, almost a year ago, almost, yeah. a little less than a year. And then you just planted the seed. And then I, you know what, I'm just like everyone else in here. And I'm like, uh, it's about time. You know what, write a book, I ain't got time for that. I got work to do. So that's what I was doing. But you planted that seed and you wouldn't let it go. And then Lisa, well, she's forget it. She kept saying, no one needs to talk to you. And I said, oh, he's going to ask Lisa me about the Cummings book. Lisa Cummings is one of our advisory board members. He's going to ask yeah. me about the book. And so in July, I spoke to you and I yeah. said, okay, Noel, you did it. We're going to do it. And so I took it very, very seriously. And not that I could do it because I have no competency on my own. But I said, if you want it, let's do it. I'm yeah. ready, and so we did. So now, even though she hangs out with the mucky mucks in Washington, you could tell by the title of her book she's from the hood. She's from the barrio. Yeah, dulcified. That's right. Dulcified, sweetened by the education of life. Dulcified, uh, sweetened. Okay, she. That's that's good. That's yeah. good. So uh, now we wanted you to come. Um, Lisa, you, you've done so many impressive things, uh, principal of a school in Lubbock, Texas, which is a hard job, isn't it, folks? So, uh, but tell us your story. Tell us your okay. story. Okay. Um, let me see where I will start because I'm so excited, number one. I don't know where the story starts, and I don't know where it's going to end. I know today is just one of those days. Um, I think that a lot of people start looking at you, and, they, and, and you know this because they do it to you too. They do it every single day, and as soon as you open your mouth, they've made other decisions about who you are and what you are. And so for me, it looked a little different because I'm going to tell you, and in, it, some of the things I hate to tell you right now, I'm going to step on some toes. Can, am I allowed to say that? Yeah. Well, well, after I last did, night, so I don't think go. we have any problems. I oh, yeah, think. because we did, we did say... Uh, Way we, to go, Richard. Way yeah. to go. Shut up. Oh, Shut no. up, yeah. I like that, how, how oh, you put us in our thing, place, sir. Richard. Way it's to getting go. printed yeah. right now. Shut yeah. up. <laughs> yes, um, I am going to step on some toes because you already announced that I'm not here in my official capacity in doing that. Um, my mother raised five of us. My, mother, uh, my mother's Mexican-American, my father's Mexican national. Yes, he's illegal, undocumented, an alien. Yeah, that's my dad, okay? Um, and she actually had an affair with him, and she had a choice to make, and here I am, okay? Mm. I, for one, am very excited she was all about choice, mm. all right? Mm. 
But she didn't stop there, and she had five of us, and we have four different dads. And you're like, oh, why did she say that all out loud? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's okay, because some of the thoughts that you had, other people have had as well. My first language is not English, and I was poor, of course, because we we're migrant workers, and so I moved all my life. I'm not really from anywhere, and I don't really belong to anyone except him. And so people make choices. They make decisions about who you are and what you're going to be. What we don't understand many times is that our children's first teachers in many, many ways are their mothers. Mm -hmm. And when people would judge this woman that I love so much, I was conflicted and I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so knowing all of this and knowing that society has some frameworks put in place that they think will fix all of our problems didn't fix it for my mother. Because to become a good woman, she married a man that was going to make her a good woman. And he had five older children from two other marriages. He was significantly older. And so I'll fast forward through all of this because what I learned yesterday from Lisa Cummins is like Lisa said to me, all these people in this audience, they're all heroes. Every single one, she's talking about you. You are the heroes. You're the ones making the difference. So you know this story, you know my story. Every day you're seeing it. Unfortunately, not every day do you get to see the success of your work. Mm -hmm. You don't, because it's not gonna happen today and it's not gonna happen tomorrow and it may not happen next year and it may not be five, 10, 15 years till you get to see what you planted mm -hmm. in someone. Yeah. Wow. So today I'm here to say thank you. Wow. Thank you. I thank every single one of you that has looked at a child and listened to their dreams. Mm. And you looked at it with an open mind and an open heart and you said, oh, I don't know how that's going to happen. I'm going to leave that to God. But it can happen. I'm even going to thank those of you who are like, uh, Noel, sorry, but it ain't going to happen. Why don't you look over here? I'm going to thank you too. Because some of you have spurred in your negativity and you're just one little second of lack of faith. You spurred something else in some other people. And you said, I will do it. Have you, any of you in here like that? Like someone said, you're never going to do this. You're never going to do that. Oh, yeah? Oh, really? Let me show them. Okay, because some of us make it and some of us don't. And some mm. of it, you know, we, we tell ourselves this lie about resiliency. Mm. We say, oh, you know, kids, they're all right. They'll bounce back. That is a lie. If that were the truth, every single one of our children would be successful. Mm. And it starts with each one of us. So in the book, because I know you told me I have limited time, so I'm going to do it very quickly. All right. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> if now, you're this, able... was not, this was not in the script here. Uh... <laughs> no, but you didn't ask me. So I was like, and I'm not going to tell them. All right, then. Okay, so if you can stand, if you can stand, I'm going to ask you to please stand. And if you, if you can't, that's okay. Just do it in your mind with me because this is good because there's three things out of this book that I would want everyone to know. Okay, yeah. because you know, you must know that education work out, but how did that work out? I don't know. You know. We know. And I am so grateful. There are three things in there. And the first one I'm going to tell you is about choice. It's about choice. When you made a decision to come here, you made a choice. And you know, I said, I'm all about mission. I'm all about mission. I said, you know what, I'm gonna look on that. I'm gonna look on that. What is CCDA all about? I wanna see what, anybody know the mission of CCDA? Anybody know? Anybody, Shh, don't say it because I don't wanna like, you know, embarrass you and stuff. All right, so let me just tell you, all right? Your mission here, I know because someone talked about this vision and they wrote a mission statement. You have mission statements where you work? Yeah, do you know them? Oh, you're like, oh, I have a sign, I have a poster. It's up so, somewhere in my office, right? <laughs> okay. You know who knows their mission statement? The people at Krispy Kreme. They know their mission statement. <laughs> you're at Krispy Kreme. Okay, so I go there a little. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so I know their mission statement. Okay, <laughs> all right. That's okay. <laughs> But I hope you know your mission statement. The mission statement for CCDA says, 
to inspire, to train and connect Christians who seek to bear witness to the kingdom of God by reclaiming, reclaiming and restoring under-resourced communities. Can you do that? Yeah. Because that's your mission statement. So I hope when you came here, you had this mission in mind. And you better know your mission because every single day you make a choice to come into your place to do something. And so this is what I want you to do, okay? Because, yeah, I am from the hood, yeah. Chicago <laughs> Heights is where I was born, so all right, all right. Okay, so, so I'm going to show you a little, couple of gang signs, all right? So don't tell anybody Dr. Ramirez was throwing gang signs. Okay, so I was. All right, here we go. Here's the first one. Do like this. Bam! Come on, come on. Let's just put it up there. Come on. This is your choice. This is your choice. Choice plus choice equals the direction of my life. Choice plus choice equals the direction of my life. Okay, so I'm like, what? What are we doing? What? Where? <laughs> okay, let's do it again because we're going to this is just the practice one. Choice plus, plus choice, choice equals the direction of my life. Choice plus choice equals the direction of my life. Faster. <laughs> choice plus choice equals the direction of my life. All right? Tell your neighbor. Look at him. Choice plus choice. Do a little choice. text. Choice, choice plus choice, choice equals, equals the direction <laughs> of my life. Now, if you want to go you and that? do your own sign thing, no. you're <laughs> Choice. All right. Back over here. Look at my nose. All right. Here we go. Go ahead and have a seat. Because every single day you make a choice. You make a bunch of choices. You better know your mission and know that your actions are aligned to that. Every single choice. When you go and it's time to talk about the movie of your life and you're the main star. Yes, can I have your autograph? All right. And you're the main star. Did you make all the choices to make it end the way you wanted to? When we sit here at CCDA and we say right here that we're here to reclaim the kingdom, is that what our choices are showing? Hmm. Is it? You know, because we can sit here and we can talk about educational reform, because I like to talk about that. <laughs> yes. But reform and being innovative, sometimes we need to go back and look and reform what's important. Mm. Reform the fact and the notion that every single one of you can contribute to winning this war. Mm -hmm. We talk about our teachers all the time, and I hear, I hear teachers say this all the time. And I love it because my favorite job was being in the classroom as a teacher. We can tell. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I now, teaching. I think you've been yeah. out of the classroom too long. You <laughs> no, just I kinda, go back. Yes. Come on, here because, we go. Uh. <laughs> because we say, and you hear the teachers, and you see this face, you know, they're looking, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm still in the trenches. I'm in the trenches. Guys, who are we saying is the enemy? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. What? Yeah. That's good. When did our kids become the enemy? When did our parents become the enemy? When did our communities and our churches become the enemy? We have to reform and revisit and be innovative in the way that we approach that. And that takes me to the second thing, competency. Now, I hate to tell you, I'm really hardcore about being competent because I'll be the first one to tell you that being certified doesn't mean you're competent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Mm. Just because you got your degree back in 1913 doesn't mean <laughs> that things are still looking the same. <laughs> and if your teacher is laminating those lesson plans, I'm just saying, okay? <laughs> just saying. <laughs> and as leaders, as all of you are, as all of you are, as all of you are, you want us to stand do not up? be afraid. <laughs> yeah. They're like, ooh, who told her? That Lisa Cummins, she's in trouble. She told on us. Don't be afraid yeah. to have those difficult conversations. Wow. Do not be afraid. You know where your strength comes from. Mm. You know yeah. where your strength comes from? 
Nicole talked about this. Michelle Ree spoke about it. I want to know which child you're going to look at straight in the eye and say, I choose to sell you out. Mm -mm. Hmm? Mm. Which one? Yeah. And is it going to be okay when that child is yours? Mm. Is it? It would be very, very easy for us to step away and just say, mm. you know what, I can't. It's overwhelming. I'm tired. We need to support each other. Mm. We need to come into agreement about some things. We need to understand that I know and you know teachers don't get paid much. Mm. But they're getting paid exactly what the contract said when they signed it. I'm just saying what, what no one switched it. No one went in there and changed in the middle of the night. No. You accepted it. And this is a ministry. It is a social justice issue. Mm. It is a social justice issue. Mm. Because what some of you don't know is that I'm a high school dropout. Mm. So oh, yeah, I, I forgot to wow. mention that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, because... You know, all the gang and the assaults and all that, uh, sorry, oh. assaulted the principal. They don't like that. <laughs> they, you should never try that again. No. <laughs> yes. So believe me, you know that old saying, what goes around comes around? As a principal, I was ready. <laughs> Bring it. Bring it. But thank goodness, forgiveness, mercy. Woo. Thank you, Jesus, for that. But you know, <laughs> he's like, who invited her? <laughs> Sorry, Noah. Well, uh, you, you have a third point? <laughs> actually, I do. Thank well, can we, can we hear it? <laughs> yes, actually, you can. Okay. <laughs> because the third point is about compassion. It is about compassion. Yeah, Noel, about compassion. All right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I, I really love it because as Christians, we're like, oh, let's all be compassionate and feel sorry for everybody. And it just, no, uh -uh. I ain't hearing that. This is not about pity. That's not what compassion is. All right, that's good. Come on. When we're talking about compassion, you better be ready to make the choice to partner it with action, to relieve okay. hmm. someone's hmm. pain. Compassion is recognizing someone else's pain and choosing to do something to relieve it. That means you're going to have to do something. Dang it. Mm, mm, mm. More things to my list. <laughs> and the reason I wanted to point out compassion mm. is because one of my first opportunities to witness compassion was actually in a school, believe it or not from this beautiful, beautiful woman, and she was my fourth grade migrant teacher. Wow. And you say, well, how can she be our migrant teacher? Because back in the day when I went to school and our, our building was out in the barracks and the portables that they put, the uh, principal would come on the intercom. Pardon this interruption. Will all the Mexican kids please report to the portables? And I was like, that's me. So I got up and I ran to the portables, and in that mm. room, every single day, was this large, beautiful woman mm. with short black hair, beautiful makeup, long eyelashes, and her name was Miss Pace. And this is what Miss Pace did to me. Miss Pace had no clue what was going on. She didn't speak Spanish, but she did this. Mm. She wasn't afraid to touch me. Mm. She wasn't mm. afraid to be near me. Mm. And she wasn't afraid to invite my mother to open house. Mm. Mm. She invited my mother to open house, and that day I was so excited. And I said to my mom, please, please, please go. But my mom doesn't speak English. And you already know what the people at the school think about my mom anyway. So who really wants her at the school? Because really, what can she contribute? But Miss Pace invited her. She had a little note with her little name to Maria right on there. And I took it to my mom. And that was the only time ever that my mother went to the schoolhouse on our behalf for something good. 
Mm. Wow. And that night, Miss Pace and my mom looked at each other and did this. <laughs> <laughs> and they understood each other. Mm. And as they did this to each other, this is me, okay? Should they look at me and they're like, so what do you think I was doing? Show me on your face what I was doing. <laughs> Big Kool-Aid smile. <laughs> because she saw me. She saw me. Mm. And she dignified my mother, whereas everyone else couldn't or mm. wouldn't. Wow. So to me, that is very important. And yeah. I know that you have a guest that you want to talk about, too. <laughs> Just don't beat me up. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't. Those yeah. days are gone. I've been changed. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I won't ask you, Nicole, if you've beaten up your principal. Oh, yeah, that's a different story for another time. No. Well, uh, listen, I do have another guest, and I'm really uh, excited to have you meet this person. Uh, I want you to meet, I'm going to have her meet me up here for now. I want you to meet uh, really one of the most important women in my life. There's uh, my mom, Mary Ann, my wife. <laughs> and uh, Mama Jo Reese, okay? Um, Mary Jo Reese was my fifth grade teacher, okay? I want her to, yes, come on up here, yes. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, man. <laughs> Neither one of us has changed much, uh, you know, <laughs> since fifth grade. But uh, Mary Jo um, has really, I mean, she was the first person that did what both Nicole and Lisa have been talking about. That's what she did for me. As a little kid, with a lot of problems at home, uh, broken relationships and poverty, and we didn't know anything about Christ at that time, lack of love, lack of you know, stuff that all of us know is so important. Uh, my language, first language was Spanish. Now I can barely speak, you know, either language, English or Spanish, right? <laughs> but um, Mary Jo was that teacher that um, just poured into my life, touched my life, changed my life, really, with her love. And she's been uh, stalking me ever since, okay? <laughs> so all these years. But would you uh, give a little love for Mary Jo? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we're we're gonna yeah. Now we're gonna sit down for a second and have a little conversation. But here's what I want to do. Uh, uh, there's a lot of times when uh, we talk about the education issue, and and you know we're it's easy that to want to find blame. That doesn't just happen in education. It happens in every area, right? immigration, uh, whatever, right? Uh, but today, here's what I want to do. I want to honor the teachers that are here. If you're a teacher, would you stand up? If you're a teacher somewhere, public school, uh, Christian school, home school, little school, big school, college, whatever, would you stand up? <laughs> yeah, we want to we wanna honor you. Yeah, we want to tell you that uh, we recognize that what you're doing is really important. So, uh, yeah, let's, Mary Jo, why don't you come sit over here by me for a second, and I'm going to give, uh, you know, I'm going to give you a minute just to, to tell everybody just a... A minute. Yeah, How a couple about minutes, that? you know. I, I flew you... all the way from Washington State. <laughs> you never tell uh, a teacher you give them a minute. <laughs> Take Won't as work. much time as you want, so long as... Uh, oh, no, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your story. Oh boy, well, I have a lot to tell. But um, I have taught for 35 years, and uh, I would like to take you on a quick journey uh, that began, began in 1965. Uh, you're going to have to do a little visual uh, readaption because at that time I was 25 years old, and I was a single mother of a two year old daughter. My last name was Martinez, and um, 
I, you know. You mean you're now Mexican? No, but that, I got <laughs> hired by a job once because they thought I was in California. <laughs> Boy, weren't they surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, Build a quota. <laughs> And then the other thing is I want you guys to really realize that at that time my hair was dark brown. So, okay, we got the big stuff out of the way. Now we'll get into the meat of it a little bit. When I started teaching, it was during um, the time of Martin Luther King, and I taught in an all-black school in special education. I continued on, and I substitute taught. I was a homebound teacher which dealt with kids that could not come to school because of their illnesses, or because of the fact that legally the court system said, you can't go to school, you're too bad. And in the process of all of this, um, I also taught grades K through uh, adult education at Seattle Pacific University as an adjunct professor in education. So, you know, and I had repeated students. I don't know, they kept coming back. Um, it was one of those things when I was teaching in high school and the kids would come the first day of school and to my classroom and I'd give them the syllabus and I said, okay, now if you don't like what I'm doing, I said, go to my husband who happened to be a counselor at the high school and, and drop my class. And uh, he would get all frustrated and then the next day they would all appear at my door. I said, what are you guys doing here, you know? So uh, it was a long journey, but some of the things that uh, where I was, where I taught, um, I taught in predominantly uh, low economic schools, and um, I was a recipient of Title I at that time. That's how I was able to pay for my college education. And um, the children I had during this time were of every color, uh, uh, culture, and uh, ethnic background. And I've heard different things today. Now, as a white teacher, if you go into another cultural area, it is your responsibility to learn about that culture, to respect that culture, mm. to be a part of that culture, okay? Mm. Mm -hmm. Because at one time in an all-black school, I was the only white person that was voted, I would happen to be, uh, uh, what do you call it? I was PTA president, and I got the ACORN Award. I mean, what can I say? But I was in their homes, the people, people taught me. It was a real love session and I feel blessed because of it. I was a person that also, I fought racism at every corner. It didn't make me very popular, believe me, I've been called many names and some of you probably have been too. But the idea of this was <clears throat> I had to establish something. It's, there's a passion, you have to be able to take the blame or whatever it wants to call you stand up and, and if the, somebody said no to me I, I don't know I you know I wondered who they were talking to because that didn't work for this person not at all don't talk to me so what I did have you ever beat up a principal I hey let me tell you there's been some times when I've got and, and I'll share one of those with you too uh, one of the things that I, or some of the things that I've done is that I started uh, culture fairs that we had every year. I had culture clubs. I taught a class that I wrote and, and um, directed called Cultural Diversity. I was a diversity trainer for the district. I uh, directed powwows. I had a gothic club. Uh, Everybody, I mean, you know, when that thing went down by Columbine, these kids were walking around in their black trench coats. They needed a place. Mm. They came to me, I took care of them, and we mm. got a lot of respect because of it. The other thing that was really, you know, I, when I was teaching in this one high school that was predominantly white, I was in charge of the Martin Luther King assemblies. And it was so dangerous for us to have Martin Luther King assemblies in a group like this that they were only shown on television in the classroom. You talk about fights. I mean, you know, there were fights. And so because of the things that I worked out in my cultural programs with the help of your, um, my administrators, my parents, my student, the community, we were able to have Martin Luther King assemblies in the gym with everyone. And if you don't think that was a big step, 
It was most wonderful. Uh, oh, and I don't want to leave out that I was also the sponsor of a step team. I know some of you here know about what a step team is. <laughs> well, there you go. We're going to have our own. We can do our own right quick. <laughs> we had a lot of kids, minority kids, and I hate that word minority, but I call them uh, the kids of color. I just happen to be pale. And uh, so what we did is that we, they would hang in the corner. And so I would uh, go to them and they'd say, well, you know, Mama Reese or Miss Reese, whatever, you know, this is what we would like to do. And, you know, what did I know about step? I mean, I'm good going up the stairs and coming down. I, there was nothing I could do about step. So in the process, I touched base with another teacher in another district who happened to go to, she's a real step gal, and we used to bus our kids over there, right? When I first tried to get my step team announced, um, they wouldn't have it. They drill, no, 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 they're just all white. We can't have step. I mean, because these kids were every shape, color, size, whatever, and ethnic background. And so we had a, um, uh, a talent show, and my kids performed. Notice I say my kids. They were my kids. Mm -hmm. And they performed, and they were so good that they, they came in second. You know, heaven forbid they come in first. They came in second. <laughs> but at the end of our several years, about 10 years, they were performing for the NAACP in Seattle. Wow. And these kids were fantastic. They mm. were real diplomats for equality and race relations and the whole works. So that was that. You know, that, that's kind of what I did. Now, I wanted, you're, well, well, you, no, you wait, can't say wait anything. Wait a minute, I know you have three pages of notes, because uh, I saw them this morning, and we're running out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in a, a little bit here. Now, one of the things that I know you uh, could go on and on about, and you have so many stories, Can is, I tell one? Yes, you can. How you have really been able to follow and love kids. So I want you to, you know, because I think that's who you are. Yeah, that's okay. the impact you've made. So, yeah, tell us a couple of those stories. Okay, your story's going to come Oh, no, too. Yeah. you don't need to tell that one. <laughs> well, uh, I'm a real advocate of uh, home visits, and I have done this since the beginning of my education with kids. And so I want to uh, share their voice in things that, and I, I have several here, but he won't let me do it. So you'll have to talk to him sometime. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> one morning when I was teaching, uh, I had the vice principal come into my uh, classroom to inform me that uh, one of my students by the name of Cyrus had attempted suicide by shooting himself in the mouth. And uh, because he and his girlfriend, and this is very typical girlfriend, boyfriends, you know, they break up and they had um, a, a baby boy together. Uh, he was in foster care, he was alone, and he was at a military hospital in ICU. And um, of course, he couldn't have any visitors. You hear that word? He couldn't have any visitors. So I just happened to know the chief of the hospital and one night uh, she snuck me into the hospital under security and I was able to visit C uh, Cyrus. They had to graft uh, skin from his um, thigh and put it into the roof of his mouth mm -hmm. and as I rubbed his leg for the circulation we prayed together and I think that that was, um, that was a real turning point for Cyrus. Um, Gosh, I don't know. I'll tell you another crazy one, and then I'll tell you why I do these things, okay? The other crazy one is that I worked with a lot of gang members, and uh, the, the kids called me Mommy Reese, and uh, I told them, you know, I respected them, but I didn't like what they did. But nevertheless, and a lot of these guys are in prison. So uh, there's this one kid by the name of Corey. He was an active gang mem member in drug use. His father had kicked him out of the house because they just had a terrible, violent uh, relationship. And there was nothing happening with the mother as many times as I went to the home visit. And one night I got a panic phone call from Corey. And he said a rival gang member was after him. And so could I help? So what I did is I, I grabbed my car keys. I had a cute little red sports car. I'm a grandmother now, so I don't have that anymore. Uh, my car keys, along with my 120-pound Rottweiler named Molly. And we, and we headed into the inner city. And uh, I had to stop a city bus. I got Corey off the bus, 
got him into my car. We went to KFC. I fed him. I had a survival kit. I got him a bus ticket, and I sent him on to Seattle. Uh, he called me about, a, a, oh, I don't know, a month later to inform me that he was uh, gay and that he was, had AIDS and he was in treatment. I have never heard from him again, but he is in my prayers constantly. Okay, this I'm going to finish with. I don't care if you want to leave, but don't. This is the, this is the good part. This is, um, I can ask myself, and other people have asked me, uh, you know, how did you get, how did you have the fortitude? How did you have the desire? I had a family. How did I go forth and do this? And uh, I had a lot of awards, and, but, you know, uh, and I was teacher of the year, you know, all that sort of thing. But the reward was basic. I know. The reward was. No, 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 no. I'm just okay. showing you love. <laughs> See, these young ladies, they know as a woman, I am not leaving here until That's I'm finished. Right. Right? That's you right. Say it. Yeah. You say it. You're not leaving. It's okay. It's just, it's they're yeah. good. It's they're good. Happen. You got it. Hey. So, anyway, <laughs> what happened was that uh, you need to know that I did not make this journey alone. I truly felt that my vocation was given to me by God mm -hmm. as a teacher. Amen. Right. Amen. And right. that That's right. And that God expected and gave me the strength to work with each child. I felt that each child, I have had thousands of children that have been placed in my life because God said, you've got to work with that child. And so I felt very important that I had to be a role model, a follower of Christ, you know? And so the other thing was I never went into the classroom without a prayer. I mean, lots of times it was prayer for survival, but it was also a prayer that to ask God to please give me the patience and the ability to hear the needs of the child. You know, we've talked about education. And hear the needs of that child because it's so important. And I felt that Christ was with me at, at my side with every child and in my heart. And so that's why I feel that I had some successes. I guess I had a lot of successes. I was very fortunate. But um, so that was one of the things. So now that brings me back to 2011. Okay. I am now, I'm going to be 73 next year. Oh, yeah. wait a minute. Don't go there. I'm sorry. Next month. I was, I was <laughs> fantasizing here. So, <laughs> so next uh, month, I'm going to be 73. I have five grandsons. Uh, I retired in 2003. I am uh, a breast cancer survivor, and this is our month, mm -hmm. so we want right. to acknowledge yeah. that. And uh, as you notice, my hair is now white, and probably one over here was caused by him. <laughs> but at any rate, um, I am presently, I haven't stopped teaching, I'm presently a, a teacher at our church for third and fourth grade kids in religious ed. Okay, that's just about it. Now here's the final. I would like to share with you one of the most important uh, events of my life that happened to show you how a student can impact your life, okay? Now, I told you I, I taught for 35 years. This was in my fifth year of teaching, and it has lasted for over 42 years. It was in Milpitas, California. It was in 1970 to 1971 at Weller Elementary School. Now, I do this with my students. If one of you were my students, I could tell you today. So, mark this. In the first seat, in the second row, sat a intelligent, artistic, caring, loving, Hispanic, 11-year-old boy whose mother made the best tamales. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I have had the great pleasure of watching this young boy grow uh, into his teen years as he was a wonderful athlete and uh, as more importantly a superb student. Uh, I, wa I was there when he graduated from high school. I was there when he graduated from college. Mm -hmm. I have, like you said, I've been stalking him, but not really. Uh, <laughs> we just kind of connect. George and I, my husband, we always appreciate and enjoy the drop-ins that uh, he and the other boys would come in on Friday nights when they couldn't get a date. They'd come to our house for... <laughs> 
<laughs> it happened a lot, Marianne. I never could get a date. For uh, pizza and popcorn, and then of course we didn't have cell phones then, so he had to use our phone, or they had to use our phone to call girls. But um, <laughs> to set up, you know, for the prom and things like, like that. But th the bottom line is that um, I've watched him grow into a man. He is a loving husband. He is a wonderful father to three great kids. He's an outstanding Christian, uh, e you know, educator and author. And he's my dear friend, and I love him dearly, Noel Costalanis. <laughs> Uh, go on, go on. You got more time. <laughs> hey, would you please thank these three incredible women? All right? Wasn't that great? Uh, thank you. Just uh, as we dismiss you, yeah. Come on, stand up, stand up. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> I know, uh, I know you probably haven't had enough of them, so as we dismiss you, uh, Lisa uh, has her book that I inspired that she's going to be selling up here, and then Nicole, Lisa, and Mary Jo will be here for a little interaction session with, uh, for any of you that want to stay, that don't go to a workshop. God bless you. Have a great time at your workshops. Don't be late. Thank you.